Well, gracious and loving Father in heaven, we are grateful that uh, we have been through uh, the portions of the book of Daniel and Revelation that have shown to us the uh, king of the north, the king of the south, the uh, early advent movement. It's parallel to the uh, close of the movement in the swelling of the loud cry. Loving Father, we are here for a purpose, and we know that you've not called us here just to hear these things so that uh, we can be good theologians, but you want us to go home, and uh, you want us to share this with our church family and friends, and we would ask you, Lord, to give us a, a, a desire uh, and a love for souls that will uh, do for us uh, what even all this information cannot do. Lord, Love is a principle that we cannot generate on our own. It's a woven in the loom of heaven, we're told. And we would ask thee today, Lord, we hear you knocking at the door, and we want you to come in. Please bless each soul here that are, here, that are in the school, that they will invite Jesus into their hearts, and that he will come in and sup with them, and that they will love souls, and that they will be willing to be spent for heaven and for the souls that Jesus has died to save. Thank you, dear Lord, that you love us and that you're here with us Bless Jeff as he is going to give to us the more of uh, the wonderful good news that is in the book of Daniel, and uh, may he be hidden in Christ, and may we see lovely Jesus. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, we are making our way through Daniel 11, verses 40 to 45. Uh, we're in the midst of dealing with verses 42 and 43, and Lord willing, we'll get through verse 45 in this presentation. Where we left off in our last presentation was by identifying that um, the, the sequence of conquering for the papacy when it takes the United States in verse 41 is then the countries of the world. Uh, this sequence uh, is upheld in Revelation 13 and Revelation 17. We intend to address Revelation 13 and 17 as we move forward, uh, but it's also upheld in the writings of Sister White, as this quote on the top um, says, foreign nations will follow the example of the United States. The sequence is first the United States, then the rest of the countries of the world. In verse 43, this verse is still, must be understood in connection with uh, verse 42. Um, I think that uh, it would have been acceptable uh, if the translators would have made it one verse in terms of the, the content. I like the fact that it's broken up into two verses for other reasons, but in verse 42, when the papacy conquers Egypt, um, which encompasses all the countries of the world, it then tells us that when this is taking place, when this takes place, that uh, the king of the north shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver. And that is um, consistent with what Adventism is taught um, throughout Adventism. Um, when the papacy takes control of the world, um, you will not be able to buy or sell unless you have the mark of the beast. This is just another way to say um, that the papacy has taken control of the gold and silver and the precious things um, of Egypt or the world. Um, and it says that the Libyans and Ethiopians shall be at his steps. And this word steps in verse 43 means, you see the, the definition there, companionship, going, step, pace, step regularly. The one that uh, make, stands out to me is this last one that's highlighted, to march. It's saying that the Libyans and the Ethiopians will march with the papacy. It's telling us that the papacy conquers the world at this time, all the countries of the world, and Egypt symbolizes the world, and then it uses Libya and Ethiopia to express um, the unity that comes into the world. Um, and, of course, we know that the only kind of unity that comes into the world in reality is in a unity to persecute God's people, but nevertheless, there is a type of unity as all the countries of the world are brought together under the umbrella of the mark of authority of Rome, which is the Sunday law. And of course, Amos 3.3 3 
says, can two walk together except they be agreed? This is the coming together of all the world under the umbrella of the Pope of Rome. Um, and here's a quote that upholds what I was just saying. Testimonies, Volume 5, 101. With the ungodly, there will be a deceptive harmony that but partially conceals a perpetual discord. In their opposition to the will and truth of God, they are united, while on every other point they are rent with hatred, emulation, jealousy, and deadly strife. Now, who are the Liby Libyans and Ethiopians? Um, for quite some time, the, for me, what they were representing is um, the financial structure of the world. And I was in Malaysia, I don't know how many years ago, and a, a sister that had set through one of these prophecy schools and then was, when we came back there another time, uh, she came to me and she pointed out another understanding for the Libyan Oth Libyans and Ethiopians um, that I had never seen. We're going to deal with both of those because I believe she was right. But in terms of marching with the papacy, this is a quote that we, we need to insert here. Testimonies, Volume 7, 182. As we approach the last great crisis, it is a vital moment that harmony and unity exist among the Lord's instrumentalities. The world is filled with storm and war and variance, yet under one head, the papal power. The people will unite to oppose God in the person of his witnesses. This union is cemented by the great apostate. While he seeks to unite his agents in warring against the truth, he will work to divide and scatter its advocates. But the teaching, the belief, I believe this is valid, but what I've taught for years, but what I have an added understanding to is, is that the Libyans and the Ethiopians here are used as symbols in relationship with Egypt. Verses 42 and 43 is speaking about Egypt. It's speaking about how the, conquer, the world is conquered by the papacy, and it's putting it in the financial setting. When the papacy conquers the, the world, it comes into control of its gold and its silver and its precious thing. It's, the, it's a financial theme. So for me, for, I came to conclude that the Libyans and Ethiopians were sending a message about um, the financial structure of the world, and in the history of Egypt, you will find that Libya and Ethiopia were two neighbors, are two neighbors of Egypt to this day. And if you go back into uh, history, you'll find that uh, the Libyans who are on the west of Egypt were always a poor, nomadic country, and they've always had a desire to conquer Egypt. In fact, uh, Mohammar Gaddafi, I think I'm pronouncing that right, the, who is the head of Libya today, has actually built giant underground tunnels on the border of Libya and Ethiopia um, where he can drive tanks and uh, uh, military trucks through, all in preparation of, of one of these days he wants to invade Egypt. So it's, and that's, it's not a secret, that's an open known fact that he even has that burden to conquer Egypt. And in this passage, what, to, what it speaks to me is that Libya, in relation to Egypt, Egypt symbolizing the world, Libya represents the poor of the world. Whereas Ethiopia, in relationship to Egypt, uh, the neighbor on the south, uh, represents the rich. And the reason that I suggest that Ethiopia represents the rich is because in the history of Egypt and Ethiopia, uh, what made e Egypt rich and powerful was all the goods and wealth that came from lower Africa into Egypt. And all of that goods and wealth first passed through the Ethiopian traders, and they always made their wholesale markup on the goods that passed through. And in reality, though Egypt had all the fame and glory and the armies, the Ethiopians were consistently more be were more, were better off than the Egyptians. And so... Um, to me, one of the things that Daniel's sharing here is he's identifying uh, the capturing of the world in a financial setting, and he's using Libya and Ethiopia in relation with their historical relationship to Egypt to say that when the papacy takes control of the world at the time period when we can't buy or sell unless we have the mark of the papacy, um, that that encompasses the entire world, both free and bond, rich and poor. And in uh, the book Keys of This Blood, uh, which, uh, how many have the book Keys of This Blood? Very good book. Very, uh, 
good book in quote marks, <laughs> written by a Jesuit Catholic, if that can be a good book, but um, informative book, uh, like the, the Corrupted Mirror of the Great Controversy, it's Catholicism's uh, uh, contribution to the Great Controversy because much of what's in there reflects exactly what the Great Controversy tells us accurately, but there is a, passion, a passage in that book where Malachi Martin is describing how the current pope views the world, how he symbolically views the world, and Malachi Martin is explaining a map of the world that the pope um, symbolically views, and he's describing how the pope, in his um, planning for taking control of the world, because this pope, whether you understand it or not, this pope believes that um, he was the pope that was divinely called to be the good pope of Revelation 12, the, the man-child of Revelation 12 that is destined to rule the world with a rod of iron, and because he believes that, he has plans about how he will rule it, and when he plans on how he would rule the world financially, he divides the world up into two divisions. And in this book, when Malachi Martin is describing this, this is what it says. In short, that, and this is breaking into a big passage. In short, that contemporary map of shame would be the graphic expression of the atrocity we have come to describe so blandly as the division of the world into north and south, which is to say in plainer terms, the division of nations and populations within nations into rich and poor. It is just such a map of shame that John Paul holds, does hold up to the world in his moral assessment of the geopolitical arrangements that are setting up our future for us. On the modern map of world shame that is subject of so much of John Paul's attention, North and South do not figure as precise geographical terms. Instead, they are global frontiers where wealth and property divide not only nations, but societies within nations. Whether it is applied in the confines of the United States or in the world at large, John Paul's moral assessment of North and South is simple and clear. In a morally adjusted economy, he insists the rich should not get richer if the poor get poorer. So the Pope, as he views the world, the king of the North, the papacy, as he views the world from its financial perspective, when he believes he's going to take control of the world, he also divides it up um, into rich and poor, as John the Revelator does, and as I believe um, Daniel is doing here uh, by s the symbols of Libya and Ethiopia. <clears throat> Fearful is the issue to which the world is to be brought, the powers of earth uniting to war against the commandments of God will decree that all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, shall conform to the customs of the church by observance of the false Sabbath. All who refuse compliance with will be visited with civil penalties and will finally be declared that they are deserving of death. Notice here Sister White's quoting uh, the very same time period in Revelation 13 that the mark of the beast is being enforced upon the whole world, John the Revelator divides the whole world up into small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, or in the words of Malachi Martin, north and south, or in the words of Daniel, Libya and Ethiopia. But in Isaiah 46, 8 through 10, and I th right now, my memory of the last few days is a bit foggy. I think I may have read um, a quote from Great Controversy. I'm sure that I've referred to it, and I know we refer to it as we move on further, where Sister White is dealing with the dragon of Revelation 12 in Great Controversy, and she says the dragon in Revelation 12 is Satan, but in a secondary sense, it is pagan Rome. Yes, we did read that. And... Um, so for me, it isn't a problem to take some, a, pa a symbol like Libya and Ethiopia and see a primary and secondary understanding within a passage. In fact, it's not a problem for me to see even beyond secondary um, understandings in a passage because uh, I believe in some ways the Bible is like an onion. And you can pull that first peeling off an onion, and there's another peeling, and you can pull the next peeling off, and there's another peeling, and you just keep going. Only thing is, is with an onion, you finally get to the end. But 
the Word of God, I think it probably just keeps going because we've been told we're going to study it throughout eternity, and eternity seems to be a very long time. So there's a lot of layers that you and I haven't even come to scratch. So I'm not threatened if we see a symbol in uh, prophecy that has different levels of meaning. But in Isaiah 46, 8 through 10, still dealing with Libya and Ethiopia, it says, Egypt riseth up like a flood, and his waters are moved like the rivers, and he saith, I will go up and will cover the earth. I will destroy the city and the inhabitants thereof. Come up, ye horses, and rage, ye chariots, and let the mighty men come forth, the Ethiopians and the Libyans that handle the shield and the Lydians that handle and bend the bow. For this is the day of the Lord of hosts, a day of vengeance, that he may avenge him of his adversaries. And the sword shall devour, and it, will, and it shall be satiate and made drunk with their blood. For the Lord of hosts hath a sacrifice in the north country by the river Euphrates. Brothers and sisters. That should be Jeremiah. Oh, okay. That should be Jeremiah what? 46, Okay. I stand corrected. Jeremiah 46, 8 through 10. But notice where this sacrifice is. And of course, if you take your concordance and run the word sacrifice, you'll see that the Lord plans to have a sacrifice at the end of the world. And it aligns with so many other places um, in Scripture. But one place, just so we can put it in reference, that we can line it up with, is Armageddon. This is the fa final battle of the Lord. And notice where it takes place. It takes place in the north country by the river Euphrates. It brings all this uh, to bear to tell us, end of the world, end of the world. And here, the Ethiopians and the Libyans are representing military power. Um, so when you factor that into this testimony about Egypt in verses 42 and 43, and you look at the Libyans and Ethiopians shall be at his steps, and shall be at his steps means we'll march with him. It's saying that the entire world will find no escape. It will find no deliverance. All the countries of the world are going to be brought under the authority of Rome, and their military and their economic power are going to be brought under the control of Rome. And, of course, this is consistent um, with what was started back in verse 40 when the military and economic aid came to the papacy, aid to sweep away the Soviet Union. This is consistent with what the United States supplies, but it's also consistent of the New World Order and what takes place. At the end, oh, here we go. Um, the Libyans and Ethiopians shall be to step. Thus, while the dragon primarily represents Satan, it is in a secondary sense a symbol of pagan Rome. I, you know, I need to apologize here. Um, maybe I don't. We're not supposed to apologize. <laughs> I need to say something here. Uh, coming into this prophecy school has been a tad hectic. Um, the, la the few weeks before uh, that we all arrived here, I was out in my garage where our office has been moved while we're trying to remodel our house, our kitchen, and I've been, all my waking hours, have been putting this PowerPoint presentation into PowerPoint, and as I was putting it in, I was happy, I suppose, on how I was arranging it, but I'd move on to the next study and the next study and the next study, and as I'm going through these, I forget, you know, how I laid them out, so I'm being kind of redundant. If I would have just pushed the button, I would have seen that quote I was talking about a minute ago, but I have a similar thought all the way through, I guess. So that's why I'm being a little bit redundant. I haven't looked at these notes since I put them into this computer, and that was a long time ago, it seems. Libya and Ethiopia represent military power, which will come under the control of papacy, but they also represent the rich and poor of the world. They are symbols of financial and military forces in the world. Uh, they parallel Revelation 13, verses 15 to 17. This is the very same time period that Revelation 13, 15 to 17 is in present truth, present history, and it says he had power to give life into the image of the beast, that, it should, <coughs> that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many, of them, as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed, military strength, and he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, Libya and Ethiopia, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell economic, um, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. 
And uh, at this point, um, we'll just continue right on into um, verses 44 and 45. None to help. Let's start by reading um, verse 44. But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly make away many. The first thing that I think we need to uh, identify in this verse is what this tidings, the message, tidings meaning message, out of the east and north uh, symbolizes. We did a little bit of groundwork on that already, whether you recognize it or not, we have. But let's, let's speak about tidings. What was the result of the outpouring of the Spirit on the day of Pentecost? The glad tidings of a risen Savior were carried to the uttermost parts of the world. Tidings is a message. Before the work is closed up and the sealing of God's people is finished, we will receive the outpouring of the Spirit of God. Selected Messages, Book 1, page 111. If it's not in your pages, you'll just have to not look at your pages. You would have had to see the, the process that was going on in our garage, trying to put these booklets together just before we came here. Okay. Isaiah 41, 27. The first shall say to Zion, Behold, behold them, and I will give to Jerusalem one that bringeth good tidings. Good tidings is a message. Brothers and sisters, I wish, I don't think we'll have time for this, but I'm going to throw this out to you because this is a prophecy school. Over and over and over again in God's word, when you find a history that's dealing with the loud cry or midnight cry time period, there is a literary technique that is used. And you find it throughout Scripture. And if you don't see it and say, oh, that's a marker, that's telling me something, then you read through it over and over again. But once you see it, once you see it, and, and you, you need to test this, see if it's true, but if you test this, you'll see that it's true. That in the Bible, when there are passages that are identifying the midnight cry or the loud cry time period, invariably the different Bible writers will do something, uh, use a literary technique. And what it is, is they repeat the words. And basically, the midnight cry and the loud cry are the second and fourth angel's message. And both those messages are Babylon is Fallen is fallen. And the literary technique that is used by the Bible prophets, and I'm not so sure that any of them consciously did it, is that they will repeat a phrase or a word. And when you see a phrase or a word repeated twice, stop and read and, and ask yourself, is this an illustration of the midnight cry or the loud cry? And you'll find out it is. It is. And we just read one of those, so I thought I would throw that out. Isaiah 41, 27 is an example of this. We can't go very far on this. I just want to acquaint you with it if you've never seen it before. The first shall say to Zion, Behold, behold, there's the repetition. And it seems simple. You may think I'm stretching it, but if you test it, um, what that is, is it's a way of saying Babylon has fallen, is fallen. This is the second or fourth angel's message. And it proves true throughout Scripture. And I see some people shaking their head. They've tested this before. It's sound. And it allows us to be in a passage of Scripture and nail that particular history down either to the Millerite movement or the 144,000 time period. But that's not um, what we're dealing with here. We're dealing with the message being the tidings of verse 44. Um, now, how do we identify what this message is? Um, by identifying how this message is symbolized with east and north. And we have read this already in this prophecy school. Isaiah 41, the righteous man from the east is Christ, but he's also the one from the north. He's the one that shall come from the rising of the sun, and he brings to Jerusalem good tidings. The message of good tidings, the message of Christ's righteousness is symbolized by east and north. 
And uh, these aren't the only places. We're just going to give you a couple. You can identify east and north um, throughout Scripture as symbolizing what we're going to share here. In Matthew 24, 27, it says, For the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth unto the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. East symbolizes the second coming of Christ. Sister White confirms this. She says, Soon there appears in the east a small black cloud about half the size of a man's hand. It is the cloud which surrounds the Savior and which seems in the distance to be shrouded in darkness. The people of God know this to be the sign of the Son of Man. East symbolizes the second coming of Christ. It also symbolizes in Isaiah 41, Christ our righteousness. Revelation 7, verses 2 and 3. There are certain passages in Scripture where you can put your finger and say, this is where we are. Where can you put your finger in the study we're doing right now and say, this is where we are? Right between verses 40 and 41. That's where we are. We're right between verse 40 and 41 in Daniel 11. But we're also, in this Scripture, we're right here. And I saw another angel ascending from the east. The sealing message comes from the east. East symbolizes the sealing message. But I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four winds, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. We're in that time period right there where the winds are being held, waiting for God's people to prepare a character that perfectly reflect, reflects Christ's character. And if we have any kind of spiritual discernment, we can see that those winds are beginning to be let loose. I'm sure Russell will deal with that a little bit further. North. Um, judgment comes from the north um, in Bible times when the, um, Israel was in disobedience and the Lord allowed her enemies to attack her. Invariably, the, the enemies, instead of coming directly across the desert, they would go up and they would come down out of the north. In biblical history, um, the north symbolizes judgment. Jeremiah 6, 22, 23 Thus saith the Lord, Behold, a people cometh from the north country, and a great nation shall be raised up from the sides of the earth. They shall lay hold on bow and spear. They are cruel and have no mercy. Their voice roareth like the sea, and they ride up on horses, set in array as men for war against thee, O daughter of Zion. Judgment was being brought from the north. Behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, saith the Lord, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring them against this land and against the inhabitants thereof and against all these nations round about, and I will utterly destroy them and make them an astonishment and a hiss hissing and a perpetual desolation. North symbolizes the judgment, our message. Tidings out of the east and north. East and north symbolize the righteousness of Christ. East symbolizes the sealing message. East symbolizes the second coming of Christ. North symbolizes the judgment hour message. If you look very closely at the spirit of prophecy, you'll find that these are all truths connected with the third angel's message swelling into a loud cry. In verse 44, the message of east and north that uh, confronts the Pope of Rome just as he's been placed on the throne of the earth is the loud cry message reaching the very height of its swelling. And it says that this message will trouble him. Therefore, he shall go forth with great fury to utterly destroy and make away many. Um, and uh, we know this is going to take place. The whole world is to be stirred with enmity against Seventh-day Adventists because they will not yield homage to the papacy by honoring Sunday, the institution of this anti-Christian power. It is the purpose of Satan to cause them to be blotted from the earth in order that his supremacy of the world may not be disputed. To go forth with great fury and destroy and utterly make away many, in the Hebrew it implies martyrdom. It doesn't just mean persecution. It means persecution that includes the spilling of blood in the Hebrew language. 
And this is in agreement with what we know from Maranatha 199, which says, when this grand work is to take place in the battle prior to the last closing conflict, many will be imprisoned, many will flee for their lives from cities and towns, and many will be martyrs for Christ's sake in standing in defense of the truth. The last great warning had sounded everywhere and it had stirred up and enraged the inhabitants of the earth who would not receive the message. That's the early writings 279. Great Controversy 621 says, The season of distress and anguish before us will require a faith that can endure weariness, delay, and hunger, a faith that will not faint, though severely tried. The time of trouble such as never was is soon to open upon us. And we shall need an experience which we do not now possess and which many are too indolent to obtain. It is often the case that trouble is greater in anticipation than in reality. But this is not true of the crisis before us. The most vivid presentations cannot reach the magnitude of the ordeal. Verse 45. In the midst of this battle, over the message of the loud cry and the authority of the Pope of Rome. We come to verse 45, and it says, And he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end, and none shall help him. He, the papacy, shall plant. Plant, um, you see the definition from Strong's there is to plant or, or strike. He's going to take a position. He's, the Pope of Rome is going to take a position in this final battle. Remember, what's being portrayed in the book of Daniel is the rise and fall of nations, and this is a conquering. This, these verses are set um, within the theme of the, um, an army conquering the world, and uh, just as he has the world conquered here in verses 42 and 43, he comes to his last battle. And uh, he takes his position, and he places his tabernacle. Now, you notice the tabernacle there from Strong's, a tent, a home tabernacle tent, primary root to be clear. If you look um, closer into the word tent, there are several words in the Bible that are translated tabernacle. This particular word is a tent that was an ancient war tent. The kings, when they would go out to war, they had movable tents where they could move from battle to battle. Thus, this particular word that's translated tabernacle, which we call tent today, is also contributing to the, the theme of these verses that this is a warfare that's going on. He pla places it in the, the center of this battle. The change of the Sabbath is a sign or a mark of the authority of the Roman church. Those who understand the claims of the fourth commandment choose to observe the false Sabbath in the place of the true and are thereby paying homage to the power by which alone it is commanded. The mark of the beast is the papal Sabbath, which has been accepted by the world in place of the day of God's appointment. There are two entities here. I cause some people... Um, a little bit of consternation at this point. Um, and what I'm suggesting to you is this is the seas. This is the holy mountain. And this is the king of the north. He has placed his self in between two entities, the glorious holy mountain and the seas. Very simple, simple Bible prophecy. Isaiah 2, verses 2 and 3. And it shall come to pass in the last days. Now, brothers and sisters, the glorious holy mountain in the scriptures is, there's a lot of references to go determine that the glorious holy mountain in the scriptures is God's church. I think this is the best for this presentation because it sets, I know the colors up there are poor, by the way. Uh, it's too late to do anything about it. But he, he sets a, uh, he sets his um, position in between the glorious holy mountain and the seas just before human probation closes because in the next verse it says, and at that time Michael stand, shall stand up. And Isaiah places this at the very same time. He's given us the definition of what the glorious holy mountain is in the last days. 
And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it and many people shall go and say, Come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his path for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. The glorious holy mountain, Jerusalem, Zion, is God's church. And in the last days, not only is God's church established, from God's church goes forth his law. And where's his law going forth to? To the people of the world, the intended receivers of this final warning message. It goes forth from Zion to try to give the final warning message to the seas. And uh, here's where I cause some people consternation. I'm a King James person. The King James Bible is the Bible. That's the Bible, okay? Um, but I believe that the, in this case, unfortunately, this is where some people have some trouble with this presentation, that the modern translations give a little bit better definition of verse 45 in the sense that they make a distinction right here with and, and and. Now, there's a, a doctor that may still be alive, a, a very nice Christian man, Seventh-day Adventist, and, uh, but I know his health has been poor or failing for quite some time, but I don't keep track on him, so I don't know if he's still living or not. He may have been laid to rest, but he has a study. It's one of the studies out there that opposes what we're teaching on Daniel 11. And when we first had opportunity to put this material into print, uh, where I was working, they sent it out to several people to review the material, give editorial critiquing before they allowed it to get printed. And he, of course, was opposed to it, but he was in connection. Uh, he's written a lot of books. He was in connection with a uh, university in the Midwestern United States. Somebody told me the other day that it was in Iowa. But in any case, um, he believed that it, was, it has the very finest Hebrew department of all the universities in the United States. So when he was confronted with critiquing the first manuscript of the final rise and fall of the king of the north, and it came to this verse, and he was trying to demonstrate why, why I was in error. He wrote a letter to the Hebrew department there that he'd worked with for several years, and he, in his letter it said, verse 45, and he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. The, the question here is in the glorious holy mountain. I don't believe the papacy gets in the holiest mountain at the end. The, in, the, in the rule of the first and last, in Daniel 1, 1 and 2, the king of the north, Nebuchadnezzar, he comes into the glorious holy mountain and conquers it. But at the last, the closing message of Daniel's message, he's prevented from getting into it, and he comes to his end outside of Jerusalem. But nevertheless, he contacted this Hebrew university and asked them how they would understand the Hebrew of verse 45, and he was a, uh, enough of a Christian gentleman that he wrote me a letter and told me what their response was, and their response was, is the only way that you can correctly understand this verse is that it's between the seas and the glorious holy mountain, and this is how also some of the modern translations um, teach it. I need to get that off the screen just to keep comfort level up, but... What I'm suggesting here is that he's not in the glorious holy mountain. He's between the glorious holy mountain and the seas. Okay? That's what's being portrayed in this verse. And to understand this verse a little bit further, just read on at least into the first part of verse 1 of chapter 12. It says, And at that time Michael shall stand up. At what time? Somewhere in verses 44 and 45, as the loud cry message, the message of the east and the north, is reaching its crescendo, and the papacy is attempting to block this message from the people of the world, human probation comes to an end. And also portrayed in this verse is that when this takes place, what has happened to the world? It's been divided 
into two classes, which is a common um, teaching in the spirit of prophecy. The Sunday law crisis divides the world into two classes. And here in verse 1 and 2 of Daniel 1, you'll see that the first time the king of the north comes into the holy, holy mountain, glorious holy mountain, he prevails. Um, Jehoiakim is given into his hand, but not the last time. Here's the scriptural reason why I think uh, that this is correct. This is um, Isaiah 10, 24. The Assyrian here in um, Isaiah's description is a symbol of Babylon at the end of the world. Each of the ancient prophets were speaking more about our day than they were their own day. So this is Isaiah portraying something at the end of the world. He's portraying the enemy of God at the end of the world, and he's not calling them Babylon. He's calling them the Assyrian, uh, which qualifies um, as modern Babylon without any problems, but we're not going to defend that. We're going to try to defend that the king of the north does not get into Jerusalem. And here's what it says. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of hosts, O my people that dwellest in Zion, be not afraid of the Assyrian. He shall smite thee with the rod. This is the warfare going on between the papacy and God's people at the end of time. The God's people are going to get smited with the rod. Is that not what we just read? There will be many martyrs. No human pen can describe the ordeal. So this is in agreement with that. He shall lift up his staff against thee after the manner of Egypt for yet a little while, and the indignation shall cease. Just hang in there. It's going to be intense, but in a little while the indignation will cease, and mine anger in their destruction. And the Lord of hosts shall stir up a scourge for him according to the slaughter of Midian at the rock of Oreb. And as his rod was upon the sea, so shall he lift it up after the manner of Egypt, and it shall come to pass in that day that his burden shall be taken away from off thy shoulder and his yoke from off thy neck, and the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. And yet he shall remain at Nob. Hard to see, bad color. But it's talking about the Assyrian and where he's going to come to his end. He's going to come to his end in this symbolic description of the end of the world that Isaiah is giving us. He comes to his end at Nob. And yet he shall remain at Nob that day. He shall shake his hand against the mount of the daughter of Zion. He's going to lift his hand up against the glorious holy mountain. The daughter of Zion, the hill of Jerusalem, behold, the Lord of hosts, the Lord of hosts shall lop off the bow with terror, and the high ones of stature shall be hewn down, and the haughty shall be humbled, and he shall cut down the thickets of the forest with one iron, and Lebanon shall fall by a mighty one. Notice here, Nob is Mount Scopus, the northernmost summit of the Mount of Olives, bad color, about two miles northeast of Jerusalem. It's outside of Jerusalem. It's not in the glorious holy mountain. In Isaiah's description of where the king of the north, as symbolized by the Assyrian, comes to his end. Upon the testimony of two or three, a thing shall be established. That's one. Tophet, the valley of the son of Hin Hinnon, the valley of slaughter, which is by the entry of the east gate. It's by the Tophet, is by the entry of the east gate. It's not in the east gate. It's by the entry of the east gate into Jerusalem. In other words, it's just outside of Jerusalem. Tophet means to burn, fireplace, where Israel burned their children to Moloch. Very significant uh, geographical area in biblical history. It was just outside of Jerusalem, just outside of Jerusalem. And here's what Isaiah says, For through the voice of the Lord shall the Assyrian be beaten down, which smote with the rod. And in every place where the grounded staff shall pass, which the Lord shall lay upon him, it shall be with tabrets and harps, and in the battles of shaking will he fight with it. For Tophet is ordained of old, yea, for the king it is prepared. He hath made it deep and large. The pile thereof is fire and much wood. The breath of the Lord, like a stream of brimstone, doth kindle it. That's two places that show the destruction of God's enemy at the end outside of um, Jerusalem. Now, in Joel, from, in Joel, you see it there, chapter 2 um, and 3, the whole world gets called to the valley of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat means Yahweh judges. It's in the Kidron Valley between Jerusalem and the Mount of Olives. Jehoshaphat, um, where Jah Yahweh judges, where um, the king of the north comes to his end, the story of Joel is outside Jerusalem. 
Mount Perizim, Isaiah 28. For the Lord shall raise up as in Mount Perizim, he shall be wroth as in the valley of Gibbon, that he may do his work, his strange work, and bring to pass his act, his strange act. Now therefore be ye not mockers, let your, lest your bands be made strong. For I have heard from the Lord God of hosts a consumption even determined upon the whole earth. Gibeon is six miles northwest of Jerusalem. The places where the king of the north is portrayed as coming to the end in the Bible are outside of Jerusalem. 1 Corinthians 14, 31 through 33. For you may all prophesy one by one that all may learn and all may be comforted. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. Brothers and sisters, if we have five places that we just went over, where the king of the north, the papacy, God's enemy at the end of time, modern Babylon, comes to his end, and inspiration has taken care to let us know that all these historical, geographical areas are just outside of Jerusalem, then it's consistent with uh, making sure that you don't read verse 45, that the, the king of the north is in the glory, glorious holy mountain. He's just outside the glorious holy mountain, blocking the final message from getting to the seas, uh, which in Revelation 17, 15, I must have pushed on through that. I know I had to bring it on the screen, but we all know that in Revelation 17, 15, the seas are the people of the world. Blocking the message. What, we've, what we see in this verse, Daniel is using evidently an inspired um, technique because it's used in inspiration a lot. It's when a satanic force or a negative force is attempting to block a message from God, attempting to block it from getting to an intended receiver. That's what's going on in verse 45. The glorious holy mountain is giving the final warning message as symbolized in east and north. The papacy standing in between the intended receiver is the people of the world, symbolized as the seas. And Sister White uses the same... Um, Description over and over again. Manuscript releases, volume 7, page 215. Though being unable to expel God from his throne, Satan has charged God with satanic attributes and has claimed the attributes of God as his own. He is a de deceiver, and through his serpentine sharpness, through his crooked practices, he has drawn to himself the homage which man should have given to God and has planted his satanic throne between the human worshiper and the divine father. That was Manuscript Releases, Volume 7, 215. This is the signs of the time, March 20th, 1901. He, the great teacher, was in the world. He was the light of the world. But Satan interposed his hellish shadow between him and the souls who Christ came to save. Satan will try to interpose himself and discourage the workers so as to prevent them from giving the message of light and warning. This is even dealing with the same message. Satan's going to attempt to block, block it, she says. Testimonies, Volume 7, page 35. Manuscript releases, Volume 6, page 7. Just prior to the coming of the Son of Man, there is and has been for years a determination on the part of the enemy to cast his hellish shadow right between man and his Savior. But there's other ways to block the message. I think I've seen this one. Selected Messages, Book 2, page 19. Formality, worldly wisdom, worldly caution, worldly policy will appear to many to be the very power of God. But when accepted, it stands as an obstacle to prevent God's light and warnings, reproof, and counsel from coming to the world. Same description. Idols. The things of the world are their idols. These interpose between the soul and Christ, and the solemn and awful realities that are crowding upon us are but dimly seen and faintly realized. The brethren. Stand out of the way, brethren. Do not interpose yourselves between God and His work. God and His work interposing. We entreat of you who oppose the light of truth to stand out of the way of God's people. Let heaven's sent light shine forth upon them in clear and steady rays. Let no one run the risk of interposing himself between the people and the message of heaven. 
The message of God will come to the people, and if there were no voice among men to give it, the very stones would cry out. I like that Daniel 11, 40 to 45 ends in verse 45 because hopefully by the time you get through these verses, seeing them, you're under conviction that this is the present truth message for the hour. And then you get to end it right here, these verses right here, by emphasizing that there is an effort to block the final warning message. It sets it in a kind of a present truth context. Brothers and sisters, if you study this message and find that it is true, there's no way that you can't come to the conviction that you have a responsibility to send this message far and wide. And if you choose to do so, if this is present truth, and it is, if it is present truth, and you decide to take up the work of carrying this message wherever the Lord wants you to take it, I guarantee, and I'm saying this based on personal experience, I guarantee you're going to run into resistance. I guarantee it. The Sabbath is the Lord's test, and no man, be he king, priest, or ruler, is authorized to come between God and man. People have invited me to share this message before. Sometimes I know them, and sometimes I don't. And usually I try to, re- I try to forewarn them. I'll say, This message always causes a shaking. And after it's all over, invariably the people, you know, I'll be home and they'll be back in their home, wherever it is, and you'll hear from them. And at some point in time they'll say, you know, you were right. After we shared this message, everything broke loose. And I remember hearing that from Brother Russell. It it causes a shaking. It causes a resistance. The gospel sword does that. And this is the everlasting gospel message, even though it is sometimes difficult for us to understand how such a fearful message of prophecy can actually be the everlasting gospel. But brothers and sisters, it is. And it does cut and cause division and cause a shaking. Testimonies, Volume 9, page 280. But when one man allows another to step in between him and the duty that God has pointed out to him, such a man, instead of growing and developing, will lose his spirituality. I know stories like that, too. Testimonies, Volume 8, page page 94. God means just what he says. Man is interposed between God and the people, and the Lord has sent forth the third angel with a message. Just exactly this verse. Here's the third angel's message, and here's the man of sin standing between the message and the intended receivers. Brothers and sisters, Daniel 11, 40 to 45 is the most unrecognized passage in the book of Daniel for Seventh-day Adventists at the end of time. And the reason for that is because of historical controversies and because of our Laodicean condition. And I want to go on record here to tell you that these are the verses where there is an increase of knowledge at the end of time. But even though the knowledge is increased, Only the wise are going to recognize it. That's what Daniel's last vision teaches. And in the very next book, Hosea, chapter 4, verse 6, puts this increase of knowledge at the end of time in a very serious perspective. It says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee. That thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. Daniel 12, verse 3. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, And I know that you all know that in the margin of verse 3 for wise, it says teachers, 
Now, who are the wise here in verse 3 of Daniel 12? It's the wise virgins. And I would submit to you that it's impossible to be a wise virgin if you're not teaching this message. This is the message. Now, this message is broad and, broad and wide. There's a lot of things to be taught in connection with the final warning message. But the wise are teachers. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Go to verse 10. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand. But the wise shall understand. In connection with being among the wise that understand the increase of knowledge at the end of time, there must be a purification process. That's what it says. They're going to be purified. If we're going to be those that receive this message and proclaim this message, then we should expect that we need to have our garments purified to the very depths of our soul, completely and fully. We have to have the garments of Christ's righteousness on it. And this process is what the wise will enter into. Shall we pray? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we ask that you would do what it takes to allow us to participate in this final warning message. We ask that you would increase this knowledge in our minds and our hearts and that you'd bring us into the experience where we would be purified fully and completely, that we may carry this final warning message and not be seen, but only Christ be seen in us, the hope of glory. We thank you for getting us to this point in our study. Uh, we ask that you'd continue to be with us throughout the, the rest of this week. But Lord, I'd ask that you'd put a, a burden on every heart here that's hearing this material and those that may hear this material that are being recorded that they test what they're hearing and make a decision whether this is true or false. If it's false, reject it and let people know that it's false. But if it's true, Lord, give us the strength, the wisdom, and discernment to act accordingly. We thank you um, for another day. The sun's down now. We ask that you'd uh, finish out this prophecy school this evening with your blessing and your attendance. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.